This is People and Their Poems, a podcast about the poems that make a difference in our world. In each episode, writer and educator Sandy Carlson talks with a person who has been influenced by poetry and become a poet or a supporter of this literary form. Stay tuned. Let's see. I, I suppose whatever I'm studying at a particular time influences the poetry and the poetry influences what I'm studying, or at least the way I write that. Um, and Stevens also said to write a prose that wears the poem's guise at last. So I've always tried to write a very poetic prose, but never a very prosaic poetry. I am your host, Sandy Carlson, and I'm here today with Dennis Barone. Welcome, Dennis. Hi. Hi, Sandy. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Dennis, as Professor Emeritus at the University of St. Joseph, was born in New Jersey. He attended Bard College and the University of Pennsylvania. In 1992, he became the Thomas Jefferson Chair in American Studies, the Netherlands. In 1997, Dennis received the America Award in Fiction for Echoes. He received the first Faculty Scholarship Award at the University of St. Joseph in 2016, and he has published 27 books as author or editor in a wide range of genres. Dennis, you are both busy and prolific. And I've, I've toured your website and followed the links to your books and read samples. And uh, you have quite an impressive range out there. And I highly recommend others taking the tour of your work. Would you describe yourself to our listeners as a poet? Yes. Well, I, I remember once many years ago, maybe uh, around 19... 87 or 88 at the University of St. Joseph. I, I used to host poetry readings there. And um, so that was, I came to West Hartford, my wife and I, in 1986. So one of the first uh, readers I had was Fanny Howe and her sister, Susan Howe. Not, not on the same night. I, uh, Susan Howe, um, for some, some reason, we got into a discussion of what we wanted to be called. And she said, poet scholar. So uh, I, I like that poet scholar. That, that's neat. How does your scholarship, which is extensive, influence your, your poetry? Well, when I was young, I thought it, it wouldn't. And I thought the thing to do, you know, after graduate school was to keep the two separate. Part of that might be the world was very different in the 1970s and 80s. And um, I went to Bard College where art and scholarship was very much interconnected. But then at the University of Pennsylvania, um, it, it wasn't in some ways. Um, plus, it was it was a strange thing because my my there were very few creative writing courses back in the seventies. But you know, every university or college had like one, and not every college in those days had a poet on the faculty. Uh, whereas now there seem to be more poets than scholars. But um, if English departments are lucky enough to survive at all, so in in those days. Um, uh, at Bard, Robert Kelly was the professor, and, and uh, I liked him a lot, and he was a very, he is, he's still alive, very erudite man, and learned a lot, and was highly inspired by him, and then when I got to the University of Pennsylvania, um, I wasn't in the English department, I was in something called American Civilization as a graduate student, but I took many English department courses and I took several with Daniel Hoffman and Daniel Hoffman and Robert Kelly are like Daniel Hoffman is no longer alive but they're like polar opposites in their aesthetics um, so I guess when I was young at Penn I thought I had to keep poetry and um, scholarship in some way separate and when I first came to St. Joseph I said uh, I was hired to teach English and American studies and to co-direct with Barbara Lacey, the American studies program, which no longer exists. And uh, I thought when I was hired, I had to, uh, yeah, I, you know, that I would like never teach a creative writing course. But then I, I started to pretty soon after that. And in my own writing too. So, you know, from the time I was uh, 28 years old or so then, and now I, they seem very interconnected, the scholarship and the poetry writing or fiction writing. Sometimes it's hard to tell the, uh, which I think makes it difficult for both me as a, you know, a matter of reputation or something. Like I wrote a book recently called um, Beyond Memory, Italian Protestants in Italy and America. 
which had like, you know, a number of strikes against it because nobody thinks there are such a thing as Italian Protestants. And it wasn't about the mafia at all. I don't think the word mafia occurs in the book. So that's a strike against it. And there's a lot about Catholicism in the book. You know, it had to be. But um, there's like some memoir in it or personal stuff uh, about me in Italy and my ancestors in Italy. So it's not like a real, it's not a traditional uh, academic book, you know, like a, I don't know, a very strict historian may not approve of it or something. But then it's not a book like Charles Olson's Call Me Ishmael either. I don't know if it's really a hybrid book, not at all. Um, it's just in between things a little bit. So when, when, um, when you're writing poetry, how does your scholarship come into play in your thinking and in your creative process? Well, Wallace Stevens, our neighbor here, he said that uh, poetry is the scholar's art. So I think poetry, not that it should be difficult, but it should have like, uh, uh, I would say like brilliant conception. And uh, I'm not really a conceptual artist, but um, I think one book I did many years ago was kind of a book of conceptual poetry called Forms Froms. So um, I'm always, I'm open to ideas, but I don't want the um, poem to be uh, about an idea. Let's see, I, I suppose whatever I'm studying at a particular time influences the poetry and the poetry influences what I'm studying, or at least the way I write that. Um, and Stevens also said to write a prose that wears the poem's guise at last. So I've always tried to write a very poetic prose, but never a very prosaic poetry. Okay. And I think I'm really baffled by, you know, I sound like a curmudgeon sometimes, but I'm baffled by much of contemporary poetry because I can't see what makes it a poem. It seems so anecdotal. And if it didn't have um, line breaks in it, I don't really understand. You know, it, it, it relies very heavily on narrative and not on like song. I also um, like the adage of Louis Zukofsky's lower limit speech, upper limit song. I suppose when I write something that's academic or journalistic, I don't try to write, you know, musically, but, but always in poetry and in um, a, a work of fiction too, but in, in a way less so there, because it's, you know, it is more discursive. So when I write a poem, I always try to think about the music, the sound of the words, the sounds is probably always to me ever since I was a teenager was much more important than the sense. Not that I want to abandon sense. R right, but the, the musicality of, of the language that, that comes through, when, I think when form and sound work together in, in the construction of a poem in that, in that creative process. But, and it may be a sign of our times too that personal narrative as the, the driving element in, in what people do. We are such a self-referential culture right now with social media and Instagram and things like this mm -hmm. that uh, going beyond that seems to be less the norm than, than in another time. As a high school teacher, I teach pose poetry and it's, it's so wonderful to, uh, the kids might not understand the inverted syntax, but they, they feel the poem and they get what the music of the language is, mm -hmm. is communicating before they'll, they'll get the point, the prose point, you know, if they could put it in a sentence, it's not so easy. So you, you mentioned Wallace Stevens a, a couple of times. Um, I'm wondering, is he and, and who else might be poetic influences on, on your own poetic writing? Well, I, I keep saying this, but when I was young, when I was young, it was certainly um, William Carlos Williams. I grew up in northern New Jersey. Uh, so I, I, the local has always been of interest to me wherever I go. But curiously, I, I never, and I don't really know much about um, Joyce Kilmer's poetry. And Joyce Kilmer, he lived in the, he, he died tragically during the First World War as a very young man. But um, he lived in the town I lived in. But, you know, basically, I know nothing about him. I guess he wasn't a big name enough. But so Williams, who was probably, you know, 30 miles south of where I lived, I, I read him a lot. And then a couple of forgotten authors um, like, um, Oh, what's his name? In Watermelon Sugar. See, I even have forgotten his name at the moment. And then in, in, in college, 
I especially liked um, an early American prose writer, Charles Brockton Brown and, and Ralph Waldo Emerson. I'm also a person who has always liked William Cullen Bryant. So then, uh, as I said, I moved to West Hartford in 1986. And, you know, how could you be a person interested in poetry, live here and not read Wallace Stevens a lot? Though I read him in college too. In fact, um, I took a course, Stevens and Elliot, and um, Bard College was always a very interesting place. And um, there was a woman there, Irma Brandeis. She was a person who studied Dante. I remember sitting outside asking her something once about A. Eugenio Montali. And then many, many years later, uh, I learned and the whole uh, world learned that when she was a young woman, she was like the muse for Montali's most famous poem, Imotete. And, you know, looking back from it 30 years later, when people found that out about Irma Brandeis, I thought, oh, how weird that I sat outside there on the walk at Bard College and asked her about, uh, I think I asked her something about Wallace Stevenson's influence on uh, Montali. Well, that, that's fun. The, uh, the poetry circles are very small, aren't they? And, mm -hmm. uh, and to, to have walked among them, that's, that's amazing. Is there, is there a poem from your, that, that in, has influenced you that, you that you could share with our listeners now? That I could share with you now? Um, geez, I don't know. That's a tough question. One poem that has influenced me. Uh, uh, Why? Well, I, I remember once um, I, I wrote about this, and, and it's an essay in a book called On Becoming a Poet. The first sort of standalone poetry publication I had is a long poem called The House of Land. And in it, I mimic the rhythm and, and of some lines from Wallace Stevens' notes towards a supreme fiction. But that's too long to read here because that's about like 30 pages and it's very dense. But, but uh, see, I, I like that because it, it has a form, and, but it's an invented form. And it's got these three sections, you know, it must please, uh, it must change. What's the third one? It must be abstract. So that's the three sections. And then there's this little coda. And each section is divided into uh, parts, which are in, I, I can't remember if they're in um, three-line stanzas or four-line stanzas in that poem. And then, so it's all like figured out. I, I, I like to, uh, and not, in, obviously not in all of my work, but I like to, you know, like figure out something. So the figuring, that's why I mentioned like conceptual poetry before. I mean, there's a real concept to the notes towards the supreme fiction. And even if one doesn't understand all these characters and all these abstract ideas that Wallace Stevens has there, there's this, you know, brilliant form. Could you speak a, a little bit to the, the place of form in your, in your writing and then that process of bringing in the music of, of language and going, going beyond the individual? You know, how, how does that all work for you? I remember, I remember, uh, like, uh, sometimes in years past, like my wife used to always say, oh, Dennis never writes anything, you know, directly autobiographical or something like that. But over the years, like you mentioned earlier, I think my writing in all kinds of forms has gotten more memoiristic. You know, I, I, I try not for every poem that's written, but sometimes to write something that has a a certain plan like Stevens notes towards the printing fiction. So in my newest book, A Field Guide to the Rehearsal, there's a long piece called Day by Day. I don't know, the background inspiration for it or something would be Robert Creeley's Day book, Robert Lowe's book, Day by Day, and um, also the Broadway musical. But but at that time, I, I, I decided beforehand, you know, I made this plan I can't remember exactly. It was I was going to begin around my oldest sister's birthday and end at the Fourth of July. Also, during that time, I had to like spend a few days in the hospital for a procedure, and so so I had like before, during, and after. So I think it was fifty days, and it was also you know July Fourth. So the country was like a whole mess then. That was a few years ago. So it had you know July Fourth national history and or, or and then my sister's birthday so that's very personal but it's a very memoiristic 
piece. So uh, so they have um, gotten more memoir like that. But it had a you know a preconceived form. You know, all of it doesn't work out. I, because I also, so I had a notebook probably. I still write by long, longhand first in cursive. And, and, and you know, like every, uh, it's not 50 pages anymore. You know, everything written is, you know, some of it, it just gets edited out. It's no good. Would you, would you have any advice for young writers who might be wanting to search their way out of their own world into that larger world you, you've spoken about? larger events america's birthday things that are happening in the world how do you how do how do you would you suggest to a writer to move from out of his or her own world into a, a larger perspective and i i hear you make reference to so many great authors and and some not so well known anymore what what, what would your advice be my advice would be well to read literatures from other countries even in translation don't always read what you already know you know, like, so everybody should have stuff they like, and that's their favorite, of course. But, you know, read something. Well, I guess this is very, like, scholarly and professorial of me, but read something um, you think, you know, you won't like. Because, you, you know, if you want to be a poet, then you have to, like, it's just like if you want to be a basketball player, yeah, and you're sick of taking the one thousand foul shot, you still have to practice your foul shot, so... You got to just because, you know, you don't like this way of writing, you know, try to read it and to understand it. So I would say read literatures from other countries and um, read more than what you already read. Read outside, you know, like the group that does interest you, whatever that be. Got it. And and how does, um, you've been writing for a long time. Can you just speak a little bit about audience? And I'm thinking, one, do you write with an audience in mind? And two, once you've written... How does your work find an audience? <laughs> the second question, I wish I knew the answer to that. I'm still waiting for that. Um, but when I write, I don't know if I really think about an audience at all. Sometimes I think about like a small audience, just of friends and stuff. But usually I have like a, a problem or something and just trying to figure that out. So I suppose it starts just with the self and doesn't move beyond that and how works find audiences is beyond me i i have chosen i suppose not to participate in um facebook and things like that and because that that just seems like so yeah i might sound you know egotistical or solipsistic in saying the work begins with me but i guess you know where else would it begin but the uh, but on the other hand i just find like posting five pictures of one's family on Facebook each day, just like a really bizarre thing that, you know, I remember like about 10 years ago and stuff, 20 years ago, people wrote lots of books about how that was affecting teenagers and so on. I, it doesn't seem to be as big a topic today, but yeah, it just seems really strange. You know, and I mean, everything's changed in 22 years. Remember like the, the Egyptian spring and like, you know, through the internet, we we're going to democratize the whole world. And instead, we ended up with a more authoritarian world. The bright promise of, you know, 1998 or something like that doesn't seem to have come to fruition. No, it, it seems that uh, through the internet, the worst tendencies in human nature have really found a stronghold. You know, and it, for, for me, I, I have some social media, but the idea of surrendering time to a Facebook post versus pen and paper or reading. It doesn't pay off and the, the, um, the artificial nature of those relationships seems to fly in the face of what we're trying to accomplish as, as thinkers and writers. Now I read it. I read an article in the New York Times yesterday about um, ghost writing. You know, as the article it said, ghost writing used to be kind of like frowned upon, but now it's just an accepted practice. And, and like, and then I picked up the Hartford Current of, uh, this morning and there was an article about a celebrity who actually I never heard of and her memoirs coming out and you know and of course she didn't write it at all but so like audience I have no idea how a person finds an audience with so much space uh, like I jokingly always say bar Barnes and Ignoble instead of Barnes and Noble because I mean <laughs> you know I love Lily Lydia Bastianich but you know how many cookbooks does she need to put out there and and you know every book 
practically in there is is not written by the person whose name is on the cover but you know what do we do with something like that how do people who actually do write their work find an audience and you know i, I realize that anything i write can't be the same as a, a work by prince harry but and then I, I read in the paper yesterday that the ghostwriter for that book actually um, did not want his name on the cover. That I, I think it said that Prince Harry, you know, offered to have the, you know, Prince Harry as toe to, and and the, this particular writer who's quite famous for for uh, ghostwriting lots of um, celebrity books, uh, he likes to disappear, but he gets a large paycheck. I was going to say the payday is worth the surrender, I guess. I, yes. I don't know. You know, I remember years ago going to a, a Borders looking for um, Tracy Chevalier's follow-up to Girl with the Pearl Earring. And I had just read the review in the New York Times. I got in my car. I drove to the bookstore. And it was already at the top of the bookcase. And this kid had to go up the ladder, throw his leg over the molding to get a copy of this book and come back down again. And um, so it was already done. You know, and I had asked him, what is what is the, the logic behind the layout of these books on these these tables? I, I don't know where to start to try to find what I'm interested in. And he said, there is no logic. We just take them out of the boxes. <laughs> so this this is where these great ideas uh, are. These great ideas are dependent on these distributors, <laughs> you know, to put them in the right place on the table at the right time on the off chance we might find them. So and, and nevertheless, we write, you know, and, mm -hmm. and we we find an audience and, and you have readings coming up. Uh, what, is, what is your experience of in-person reading? Oh, I, I certainly attend lots of readings. And as I said, I, I hosted in my years at St. Joseph more than about 150, I think, separate writers, uh, different writers, some who came several times. My experience as a reader, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess sometimes, I think, I used to like to do it more uh, than I, I do at present. I suppose I, I like writing more than standing in front of people and reading. I, I like I like being a professor though. I like you know I like talking about um, literature and I um, usually I talked or taught uh, uh, you know always about other people's work. I, yeah, unless it was a creative writing class, and then I would, you know, maybe sometimes talk about mine. But but I like to, you know, sit around. I mean, it was a nice job to have. Um, it's disappearing from our culture. But, you know, imagine sitting in a room with 10 people and talking about books that have some kind of unity, uh, and passing on that heritage. So it, it's a very good thing to do. I, you know, I, I can relate to that as as a high school English teacher, um, and the the enormous responsibility of of selecting a text and and having a rationale for that choice, and having an audience of young people that that you hope will will see the value and internalize it and understand that this language that has come come to us across millennia, possibly, tells us something about who we are even if those people don't look anything like us and the culture doesn't look like, like ours and, and that we're not necessarily better than they were, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we have a really conceited idea of evolution. <laughs> there's, maybe there's a, a, a devolution and a getting back to those, those um, celebrations of mystery that, that inspire those, those great works, you know, and, um, and I'm, I'm always struck by the, the humility uh, the, be, and I, I see that in the admission and the recognition of, of flaws, you know, in, in the epics. We, we know these, we're starting from the point of people being flawed and in search of something better in themselves and in life. And I think, I, I think that's the inheritance of the poet, you know. Um, there's a lot been said about the sort of the conceit of believing we have something to say. Well, and, and may the audience <laughs> hear it, you know. Mm -hmm. Dennis, would you be willing to to read uh, some from your own work? Well, I thought I thought you might ask me to read something, so I thought I, I have one poem here from a book called Parallel Lines from uh, oh I don't know about 2011. I chose choose this one to read. It, it's 45 years old, 
oftentimes in, in my books that have been published, you know, they're usually like more. So if it's a book from 2011, most of the poems would have been written, let's say, between 2008 and 2010. But almost in every book, I've put something for some reason, nostalgia's sake, maybe something from yesteryear. So this was a, a poem. I, I, it's 45 years old, and it, it's very simple because you know I, I uh, uh, you introduced me as a professor and so on. So I don't want to sound like overly intellectualized. It's really simple because you know I think work should be intense and complex and should have a concept and innovation and sound and shape and all that. But but at the same time, that doesn't necessarily mean. Um, it has to be overly difficult. So this is just an incredibly simple lyric. And we were living in West Philadelphia at the time. We had just started graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania. And it was snowing outside. Uh, and I was looking out the window at a parking lot with the snow coming down. And there was a bird. So I'll try to read the poem very slowly so you can, like, you know, hear the shape of it. And as I say, it's like really simple, but but notice that it's simple, but it but you know it also has this complexity too. For example, there's a line to right, just two words, to right. And this is something that William Carlos Williams did a lot. The line can go both back up and down. So it, it's one just two words there, but it's doing like the work of two lines. So it's called the start of spring. Snow and a bird's whistle. Where was the time? to write snow and a bird's whistle. It was in the spring, time to write snow and a bird's whistle in the beginning of spring. So that's a, a very short lyric. And, and so I, 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 I did like the, the books have like a, a, a I don't think all of my work is difficult. Some of it is, but I also try to um, give the readers or audience, such as it is, small as it is, a break in, in reading things too. So, the, so there are easy things in a book, like in this book, Parallel Lines, it begins with, if I remember right, some like old poems, and then it goes to a series of tribute poems. There's one for Eliot, one for Stevens, one for Robert Frost, and so on. And then there's a section of Italian poems, which doesn't necessarily mean, so, uh, there's a couple that are written in Italian. There's one poem by a man named Emmanuel Carnavale, who came to America in uh, 1910 from, from Northern Italy, and um, you ended up going back to Italy in 1924. But um, uh, I, I took one of his poems, uh, and he wrote in English, by choice he wrote in English. So I translated his um, English written poem into Italian and it's in this book called Parallel Lines. So you see there is like certain kinds of complexities and then so on. So, so in this book, this is a little book more recent called Frame Narrative. So this will give you an idea of uh, what I mean by giving the reader a break. I think the poems in here though are, are not that, that difficult. So so this, this again is very, very short. And I also think, um, you know, these, I don't oh, take myself overly seriously either and, and poke fun. But when I poke fun, I think it's usually um, self-deprecating humor. I never poke fun at other people, unless they're, we're present in a room together or something or we're friends. <laughs> Simsbury Cemetery, Dennis, whenever you are ready, call for an appointment. So that's that poem. So here, here's a different kind of poem. And, and when I was looking at the Poetry Foundation website, I saw um, this little thing there that said, uh, uh, report a problem with this poem. I guess if they had typed in or something into the website, you know, a poem, uh, Ezra Pound's 82nd Canto, and there was a, 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 a typo in the um, Latin or something, you could write back to Chicago, the Poetry Foundation, they would uh, fix it. So I just thought that was funny. So uh, report a problem with this poem. Mitch Wayne behind a window, Lucy Moore's legs below an ad in the office, Lucy's red lips as red as the seat of the cab. Kyle Hadley and Lucy wear the same color business suits. 
Mitch wears brown, brown of the bar, brown of the plane. In Lucy's hotel room, Mitch in a mirror between Kyle and Lucy. Lucy has a soda at the drugstore. Mary Lee Hadley drinks in a bar. Mary Lee and Mitch at a party. Two half empty glasses in the foreground. Drugs, 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 and a little boy on a rocking horse. At another restaurant, Lucy sits between Mitch and Kyle. Jasper Hadley and Mitch look out a window at Mary Lee being brought home. Mary Lee dances with Mitch's photograph. Jasper has a heart attack. Lucy and her red lips again, now in red seat, now in a red seat in the library. Mitch still in brown. Mary Lee and Kyle framed in a window looking out at Lucy and Mitch. Brick wall, Kyle's face, all eyes on Kyle. No ito, suggestion of blackmail. Mitch says, how far we've come. Mitch and Lucy ride off, last image, a gate. So that, that poem is just a, a, a sort of odd synopsis of the plot of a Douglas Sirk film from the 1950s. So report a problem with it. Well, that, that, was, that was great, Dennis. I, I found myself wondering where Lucy was going to show up next. And your, your poem about the, the snowy day and the bird in Pennsylvania, I, for me, it had the immediacy of, of correspondence, you know, something very intimate and immediate and alive 45 years later. Um, so thank you for sharing your, your poetry with us and your, your thoughts on poetry, a really rich conversation that I hope will take our listeners to your, to your website and to the links that will allow them to sample and purchase your, your excellent books. Thank you. Have a good weekend. This has been People and Their Poems podcast about the poems that make a difference in our world. Be sure to check the show notes for any special links relating to this episode. If you want to learn more about the podcast, visit peopleandtheirpoems.net. Or if you want to learn more about Sandy and her work, visit sandycarlson.net. Thanks for listening.